from Wingate University and WUTV. This is Wingate Today. Ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2013. May 11th on the Academic Quad, a new chapter begins for almost 450 graduates of Wingate University. Hello and welcome to Wingate Today. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Here are the numbers from the 117th commencement. There were 445 graduates in the class of 2013, 90 received doctorates, 100 earned master's degrees, 255 baccalaureate degrees. They came from 32 different states and 15 foreign countries. And it was a day they'll never forget. Few things in life are steeped in as much tradition or carry memories that last a lifetime. Commencement does both. The procession. The alma mater. The president's welcome. On a beautiful Carolina morning. The class of 2013 enters the job market with unemployment still high. But no one's doubting that these graduates haven't been prepared. Hillary Mayo traveled halfway around the world to get here. One of Wingate's international students, Hillary Mayo, is from Eldoray, Kenya. I'm so happy to be done. I feel like I've accomplished it. Talk about sacrifice. His father and two brothers traveled 7,700 miles to get here. I'm so happy. I mean, I'm, I can't even say anything because it's just unbelievable. I didn't believe that they were going to make their way all the way to the United States. Pamela Beach Merrill, magna cum laude. They weren't the only ones who had to go far. Pam Merrill is graduating with a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy. She's been working on her degree since the fall of 1993, 20 years, taking one class at a time. I've enjoyed it immensely. The professors are, they really are good. I, I, every time I learn something new, I just feel so thankful and, and it's exciting. Merrill works at Wingate. Her husband, Don Merrill, is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Reviving a practice that began last year, the class of 1963, celebrating their golden anniversary, led the graduates of the class of 2013 into the academic quad. And the university awarded two honorary doctorate degrees to G.R. Kinley, longtime mayor of Rockingham and North Carolina Board of Transportation member, and Frank Davis, executive director of the Cannon Foundation, created by textile magnate Charles Cannon and has given millions of dollars to Wingate in the last 60 years. Under picture-perfect skies, in a little over two hours, the charge from the president. I challenge you to aim high, work hard, pray often, expect much, be willing to give even more, love your neighbors, do well. And as it has for the last 50 years, the song that's come to define the Wingate experience. Precious memories flood my soul. For the first time in the university's history, Wingate's commencement could be seen live anywhere in the world. Graduation exercises on the quad were streamed live in HD on the internet. Working with equipment provided by the Wingate Sports Network and WUTV 22, viewers were able to watch the two-hour commencement on the web, and about 500 did so. If you'd like to see it, we have it archived. Go to our website, wutv22.org, and click the link that says Commencement 2013. Former Carolina Panthers kicker John Casey was this year's commencement speaker. Hear what he had to tell the graduates and how his life changed in the month of May later in our program. Look at this. Before students got out of town, they left some of their belongings behind. And here it is piled on the floor of the Sanders Sykes gym. It's a Wingate-sponsored event called Don't Dump, Donate. Yeah. The students, things they didn't want, rather than toss in the dumpster, organizers from UCAN, the University Community Assistance Network, collected it, sorted it, and then offered it to the needy and others in the community. Absolutely free. There were appliances, couches, and even an exercise machine. What I enjoy about it is just thinking about the whole process. Somebody is going to have a good day today. Somebody's going to have a good day tomorrow when we continue to. I mean, we're just going to make somebody smile today. Volunteering is, is a big thing in the community, and I love doing it. And I just like to help people out and see them smile. Organizers say this year's effort was one of their most successful. They made it easy. Students just had to leave items by the door, and volunteers came by and picked them up. One more end-of-the-year note before we move on. Would you believe this is a cake? 
a Wingate Bulldog in graduation attire made for a pharmacy school graduate by Christina Kinlaw, a staff member here at the university. The entire thing is edible, except for the cap, which is made of cardboard that's covered in icing. The head is made of Rice Krispie treats. The base, well, that's icing as well, made to look like hardwood. Christina told us it took her seven and a half hours to make. It's her most ambitious cake yet. She started playing with cake decorations six years ago, taught herself how to do it. There were other degrees handed out this spring, aside from the ones on May 11th. The father of American opera was here. It's our cover story. We salute your lifetime of amazing achievement, and thank you for sharing your time and expertise with all of us. Wingate President Jerry McGee bestowing another honor onto Carlisle Floyd at a special luncheon in mid-April, an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Wingate University. The South Carolina Hall of Fame was founded in Myrtle Beach. He is perhaps the most famous American opera composer on the planet, Carlisle Floyd, inducted in 2011 in the South Carolina Hall of Fame. Born in Latta, South Carolina 86 years ago, Floyd went on to achieve worldwide fame, composing nearly a dozen major works, receiving countless numbers of music honors. His first full-length opera, Susanna, launched his career in 1956 and has become his most famous. I knew very little about opera, even when I finished college, because I really was trained as a pianist. So the idea of doing a, an opera was my own private dream. It was Anthony Dean Griffey's dream to bring Carlisle Floyd here. Griffey, a Wingate alum from 1990, first met the opera icon when Griffey played Lenny in another Carlisle Floyd famous opera of Mice and Men. That was 16 years ago at Glimmerglass Opera in Cooperstown, New York. I knew he was coming to the performance and I was quite nervous. The two men struck up a friendship and have been friends ever since. Now's the time to enjoy all the beating Tony Griffey went on to win four Grammys as an opera tenor and achieve fame in his own right. I love Carlisle Floyd's music, I love him as a person, and I thought there's no better way than to bring him to my alma mater to honor him here for a week. And that's what they did. Floyd spent a week-long residency at Wingate, coaching opera students and making an indelible impression on students. The music program making quite an impression on Carlisle Floyd. They have a very, very uh, enthusiastic and committed student body. And that's, that's your basis for a good a music program, plus a, a, an equally committed faculty. I see nothing but good things ahead for it. Which overjoys Tony Griffey. There was no opera program when he graduated from Wingate 23 years ago. It's really important as an actor who sings and a singer who acts that you really practice the lines. Griffey also spent time coaching opera students during the week-long residency. And the two men did a media tour, appearing live on WFAE's hour-long Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins. That's Jesse Wright Martin, director of the Wingate Opera Program on the left. The pair also taped an interview with WDAV 89.9 FM in Davidson and with newspaper reporters across the region. On the final night of the residency, students and faculty, along with Griffey, performed some of Carlisle Floyd's works. It was a fitting punctuation mark to a great week. Well, seeing a, a work of mine come to life on the stage with, with, the, uh, with singers, I love working with singers. I knew the students would be excited. I mean, how many times as a student do you get to work with a living composer and work on their music? At age 86, Carlisle Floyd isn't slowing down. He told us he's working on another opera. Congratulations, Georgia Lynn's With a cheer from the mayor and townspeople, they cut the ribbon on a new store in downtown Wingate, Georgia Lynn's, a boutique specializing in unique gifts. It opened the week before Christmas, but the building's owners have been renovating and restoring the outside, and that work is nearly complete on the Georgia Lynn's portion. Former State Senator Fern Schubert's Family Trust owns the one block of buildings on Main Street. It's been like doing a, a detective story to figure out what actually was here. Uh, we've pretty much established that the building we're next to was the Bank of Wingate. One of only two banks in Union County that survived the Great Depression. There's still a bank vault inside. Town officials say this renovation is an important milestone in developing downtown Wingate, and Schubert agrees. This is, to me, a very important part and, and a very significant part of what's left of Wingate, and I'm hoping it'll be sort of the gateway to the college. It's just a cute building. I, I, I like it. I love what they're doing with buildings. They're going to keep going, and 
make Wingate a cute little fun town for the students and, and the locals. The buildings date back to the early 1900s and included at one time a bank, drugstore, and general store. A husband's love is what this next story is about. Those we honor today represent the very best in family values, hard work, and honor. In April, Wingate University dedicated the new fountain in front of the Bat Center to Wingate alum Judy Love Talley. Her husband, Wendell Talley, a Stanley County businessman and farmer, gave a generous donation to the university to build the fountain in Plaza. Mrs. Talley didn't know anything about it until the day it was dedicated. We're all proud of you, Mama, and we appreciate everything you've done. Judy Talley attended Wingate as an adult, graduating in 1987. She went to college after raising her three sons. They might as well be his kids. He's given money to 41 of them. Erwin Belk, Charlotte businessman and philanthropist, donated the money for Wingate's new track and field complex. Ryan Brown of the Wingate Sports Network joins us. And Ryan, having this facility is going to be a real shot in the arm to a lot of programs. That's right, Jeff. Coming up next year, the South Atlantic Conference will add four new sports, men's and women's track and field and men's and women's lacrosse. We all know about the outstanding success that Wingate Athletics has had in the South Atlantic Conference and for men's and women's track and field and men's and women's lacrosse to keep up with that, that success, they'll need an outstanding facility and they have that down at the Irwin Belt Complex. It's great to be in Union County. It's great to be in Wingate. And a great day for Wingate University Athletics. In front of a large group of staff and supporters, Wingate officially completed the Irwin Belk track and lacrosse complex with a ribbon cutting ceremony. The track is painted bulldog blue and is fully equipped with state-of-the-art equipment and technology, while the lacrosse field is surfaced with the highest quality artificial turf. 91-year-old Irwin Belk donated the funds for the complex and has a simple message as to why. Athletics is the most important thing to do. It's part of your education. And Belk would know. He funds academic scholarships at Wingate and the new complex marks his 41st, yes, 41st complex he has built around the Southeast, including SAC member Lenore Rhine, Winthrop University, Charlotte 49ers, and North Carolina A&T, just to name a few. Wingate track and field head coach Joe Sunlin and his team presented Belk with a jacket and know very well his love for the sport. He just has a, a, a genuine love and appreciation for the sport, but just seeing him kind of uh, light up when he's talking to our student athletes and everything was, was fantastic. Men's lacrosse coach Michael Lawson and women's lacrosse coach Colleen Olmsted share Sunlin's sentiment for Belk's true passion of academics and athletics. To have that kind of energy, I, I wish I had half as much. Um, I could do a, a much better job probably if I had half his energy. Um, you know, we obviously have been out here already, but uh, we're excited to put a full year in next year and, and uh, move forward. I thought it was tremendous. It was really nice to see Mr. Belk here and his enthusiasm and energy for um, athletics and academics. And I'm really excited to have my team start here next year. And it's safe to say everyone shares the same feelings about the quality of Wingate's newest athletic facility including highest praise from Belk himself. I think you're going to be hard pressed to find a better facility um, in, in Division II and quite frankly at a lot of Division I's. We didn't cut any corners with it, uh, which you know in, in my mind and, and for the student athletes that's, that's the biggest thing. It, it shows that they're fully dedicated to um, us and our successes. Well, i say it's the most beautiful track of 41. It's these students as they run on it. Someday they'll be great. As you know, Jeff, over in Sports Information and Sports Network, we eat, breathe, and sleep Wingate Athletics for almost every day of the year. But during the summer, we like to get out and do some things on our own, participate in some sports. And coming up on next month's Wingate today, you won't believe what sport we have for you. Hopefully, we come back with all of our fingers. I'm Tease. Ryan Brown, thank you very much. Another year, another Excellence Cup. For the seventh year in a row, Wingate Athletics won the South Atlantic Conference Eccles Athletic Excellence Award, given to the program with the highest point total based on cumulative final standings in each of the conference's sports. Wingate won by 20 points over Tusculum. The Bulldogs' seven Excellence Cups is the most among current SAC member schools. I'd like to welcome everyone to the first ever Woospies. 
In a takeoff of the ESPYs, the award show on ESPN, Wingate Athletics hosted the WUSPYs, the Wingate University Sports Performance Yearly. It's the athletic department's annual awards banquet recognizing athletes who excelled this year. The show was hosted by our own Ryan Brown and was a big hit. He has nearly 15 years as a public policy economist. Now as head of the Maine Heritage Policy Center in Portland, Maine, Scott Moody. Brian Stevenson, Wingate Today contributing reporter, is here now with our alumni spotlight. Brian? That's right, Jeff. Scott Moody is an economist, but more special to me, he is my former roommate. And recently he returned to Wingate as a guest lecturer. Scott Moody and I spent many hours together cutting up and celebrating important moments in our lives and the lives of our friends. So getting him back on campus for the first time in years was a real treat. I mean, we're just across the way from our old, old place here. Yeah, just right over there. Yeah, I mean, that, that place is so full of memories, I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> Since our Wingate days, Scott has pursued his dream of being an economist. It's a career that started right here. I actually started out as a computer programmer when I first started at Wingate, and uh, through various interactions with politics and economics, I switched majors halfway through to economics, realizing that I could have a more dramatic impact on the world through economics than I could through computer science. Scott has paid his dues working for some well-known organizations. I've spent my career in the think tank world, first eight, nine years in Washington, D.C., working for the Tax Foundation and the Heritage Foundation. And then I moved to Maine to become chief economist at the Maine Heritage Policy Center, which is a state-based think tank, which is a relatively new movement uh, where all 50 states now have their own uh, think tank to push free market policy. He is based in Portland, Maine, and last year he was promoted to CEO of the Maine Heritage Policy Center, where he continues to educate people about the free market system. The best thing about my job is really doing what I love, which is education. And even though I, I love charts and I, and I love graphs, at the end of the day, if you can't tell a story with those charts and graphs, if nobody hears it, it's just like a tree falling in a forest. If nobody's around, did it really make a sound? And so I find it really fulfilling to be able to take a complex message, break it down, and, and send it out. It's that opportunity to break things down that brought Scott back to Wingate for part of the Jesse Helms Center's BB&T Lecture Series. I'm going to start with some Uncle Sam 101. His lecture taught the mostly student audience how policy decisions today will impact their lives as they leave Wingate. And as Scott and I wrapped up our visit, we reflected on how our four years here shaped our lives. This is a special place to, to both of us, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And when you, it's even more when you look back on it now, how much it shaped your future. And you didn't even know it then. As I was saying earlier, you know, if I'd gone to a big school, I probably would have just ended up swept up in the current and done nothing really special. It was really a great time for several of us friends to catch up with Scott when he came back to campus, and I'm really proud of everything he's doing up there in Maine. Brian Stevenson, thank you very much. Wingate lost a dear friend in April. Marketing professor Nancy Bush passed away while in her office on campus. Her death carried on the front page of the Inquirer Journal. Dr. Bush took great interest in her students, attending a lot of their sporting events. Her Facebook page was filled with dozens of posts from students after she died. Nancy Bush loved traveling the world. This is when she was in Antarctica. She'd visited every continent except Africa, and she planned to go there this summer. Nancy Bush was 66. Coming next on Wingate Today, his invention hit the market, and this Wingate business student has hit the mark. See what everyone's saying about Ben Barone's new app that promises to save lives. And later, one-on-one -on -one with John Casey, this year's commencement speaker. Retired from the Carolina Panthers, whose idea was it to sign a one-day contract? It's not who you think. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Brad Sellers, Parks and Recreation Director, Wing in North Carolina, inviting you and your family to our second annual Summer Fun Festival, Saturday, June 1st. The festivities kick off at 5 p.m. at the Wingate University Lake property. There'll be plenty of activities, lots of food, and at 6 p.m. the band Too Much Sylvia will be center stage. The evening tops off with great fireworks, so come on out to the second annual Summer Fun Festival, Saturday, June 1st, from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Wingate University Lake property. It's a deadly epidemic. Each year in America, nearly 10,000 people die on the roads due to drunk driving. 
Wouldn't it be nice to know when you've had too much alcohol before you get in your car? That's the driving question behind Ben Barone's new invention. You met the Wingate business student last month. Barone and his business partners created an app that works with a breathalyzer that attaches to your smartphone, the first of its kind in the world, they claim. Their invention is called Alcahoot, and it went on sale this spring. The market launch is attracting lots of media attention. Barone has been interviewed by reporters, and stories have appeared all over the country. This TV station in Greenville, South Carolina, tested the device, having a cameraman drink three 16-ounce beers, blow into a law enforcement breathalyzer, and then Alcahoot, and each time, Alcahoot came within two one-thousandths of a percentage of the police test. We realize that if we really want to save people's lives and, and offer a tool that is going to be good for them, it's got to be in a law enforcement grid accuracy. Alcahoot went on sale in late April. Right now, it's available online. We introduced you to Ben Barone last month. He was featured in Kim Williams' overtime segment. This month, Kim is reporting on not just one person, but many people. Kim? Each year, Wingate students volunteer more than 10,000 hours of community service. Our overtime story highlights some of these service projects. It's really about, you know, making them aware that there are people in need and, you know, they just try to do different things for them. Paul Gramatikopoulos and Emma Wallace, who work in the Office of Student Involvement, spearhead these projects. During Hunger and Homelessness Week in November, bags are distributed to homes in the area and picked up at the end of the week filled with food. We collected about 74 pounds of food that we donated um, <clears throat> to the homeless shelter. Throughout the year, they continue to support the homeless shelter in Monroe by making cupcakes, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and raising awareness through events like Tom's Day by going a day without shoes. The Tom Shoe Company helps a person in need for every purchase made in the One for One program. A social justice sewing group made toys for Turning Point and potholders for the homeless shelter. Students packed 70 shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child. In January, they observed the Martin Luther King holiday with a day of service. Basically, we send a group of students and they help with anything. So some group gonna help painting, some group gonna help cleaning, some group gonna help with kids. Uh, this year, we had about 70 student participates. The students helped at a church in Indian Trail, at Turning Point's Battered Women's Shelter, Sierra's Horse Rescue Farm, and at the Homeless Shelter. And the community service continues in the spring with alternative spring break trips, also known as ASB. This year we had three different trips. They went to Dothan, Alabama, which was a full week. They did Habitat for Humanity. Then they went to New Bern, North Carolina for half a week and they were working with domestic violence. They had different places they stayed each week and did, or each day and did different things. Um, played with children, worked in the house, helped clean and things like that. And then they also went to uh, Macon, Georgia and they worked um, with children as well. And they did um, after school programs and reading and tutoring and mentoring for all three of those programs. Skylar Howard, a junior, was one of the students on the ASB trip to Dothan, Alabama, helping with Habitat for Humanity. I'm used to doing a lot of community service activities and I find them to be very enjoying and happy and giving back to the community really, you know, lifts my spirit and it's really um, a, a wonderful moment for me, so I really enjoyed it. Plans are underway for next year's ASB trips. We're hoping to be able to take a trip to Savannah, Georgia, um, Charleston, South Carolina, and Nashville, Tennessee as of now. Um, and they want to work with domestic violence, um, a habitat trip, and then low country um, food bank. Wingate instills the values of knowledge, faith, and service, and our students go overtime with their service to others. Kim, that's quite a list of, of service projects. Out of all those, what do you think is the most outstanding? I would have to say the spring break trips because they take their vacation time and they help other people rather than go to the beach and the mountains. Kim Williams, thank you very much. Well, it wasn't all hard work for Wingate students. Check this out. More than 100 students, faculty, and staff showed up for the first ever Blue and Gold 5K Color Run. Color runs have become a fad across the country. Runners wear a white t-shirt, and along the race at various points, organizers throw colored chalk at them. And at the end, well, you can see what happens. To build school spirit, they used just blue and gold in this race. At the end of it, there was an ice cream social and a live DJ. Ben Richardson was out there. It must have been a blast. Jeff, it was a wild 3.2 miles. I mean, color flying everywhere. And to be honest, I was just happy to finish the race. Events like the Color Run are such a success because of social media influence. Now, many of our students are looking more to social media for information rather than traditional channels like websites, newspapers, and flyers. 
Senior Cami Perry believes this to be the case as well. I think that's true for all of our students. They prefer to go on Facebook, go on Twitter, check Instagram, see if someone's posted a really cute picture of a flyer or something before they are to actually stop and actually read the flyer or go onto our website and check our calendar. So I think social media is just easier for our students and the social media here helps our students stay involved. Events like Tom's Day Without Shoes and Springgate were huge successes on campus in part because of the social media community. While Facebook and Twitter are still the front runners in social media, there are a few others starting to trend. Two things that are becoming really up and coming is Instagram and Vine. Um, Instagram is just a place where I can like post pictures from an event and be like, hey, here are me and my three best friends at this awesome event that was put on from the school. I didn't have to pay for any of it. Here's a great picture and I can share it with the students and then they can be like, hey, I wish I would have come to that or man, I could have taken a 15 minute study break to be able to enjoy that event, grab some ice cream or something. And then the Vine, of course, like six seconds of just awesome, full entertainment where you can find out about things that are going on on your campus. Twitter's most recent acquisition, Vine, as Cami mentioned earlier, is a video-inspired platform that allows users to share their information in six seconds. While Instagram uses pictures to tell the story, this uses video. So be sure to look out for Wingate University on Vine now. Ben, how are we using Vine? Well, we were able actually to get a panoramic view of the academic quad right before graduation so we could share with the world what our commencement's going to look like during graduation. Ben Richardson, thank you very much. A follow-up to our blog talk segment from last month. Congratulations to Jennifer Jones of Wadesboro, winner of the $4,000 Wingate Scholarship. She won the Believe in the Bulldog video contest. Incoming freshmen were invited to put together a one-minute video. Finalists were selected by the number of likes on the admissions Facebook page, and then a winner was determined. Guess who's turning one year old? We are. It's the one-year anniversary of Wingate Today. The program started a year ago this month, and this is episode 12. Our thanks to those who reached out, emailed, and encouraged. We hope you'll keep watching. And finally here, John Casey. In early May, Casey, one of the original members of the Carolina Panthers, signed a one-day contract and then retired. The front office cut Casey, their kicker for 16 seasons, at the beginning of the 2011 season. He went on to play a year for the arch-rival New Orleans Saints, but in his heart, he was always a Panther. Now he's a retired one. I can't write 70,000 thank you notes. Um, I wish that I could, uh, but this is my feeble attempt to tell everybody thank you. It just, you guys have had a huge impact on my life, and I just really appreciate that. It's, I, I wish I could express in words. The same week of his retirement announcement, John Casey gave the commencement speech at Wingate, and we got to spend a few minutes with him beforehand. Whose idea was it to do the one-day contract? John Casey's wife. My wife really understood that there was a lot of people in the community that it was probably just a really good idea to do, and when I was there and kind of going through it, um, I, I agreed with her 100%. His wife and kids joined him at the Panthers news conference. For them, a rare moment to be in the spotlight, where he was often. Casey's numbers are impressive. He's the Panthers' leading scorer, played the most games, and completed the most field goals. In fact, in a 21-year career, he scored 1,970 points. Of the thousands and thousands of players who played in the NFL, only seven others have scored more. It has many people mentioning John Casey and the Panthers Hall of Honor in the same breath. It's not on his mind. That's not the reason why I played. I think there are some people that do play for those types of accolades and, and that, that's what drives them and, and causes them to go through a lot of the sacrifice that you have to go through. For me, the motivation was being able to help guys accomplish goals and achieve the things that we could do for as a team. Um, and that's the satisfaction I get. What's next? Casey's taking a job this summer as athletic director at Charlotte Christian School, where his kids attend. Will he return to the NFL in some capacity? He doesn't know. But the words he told the class of 2013 might apply to him as well. You don't know how long you'll be there, but what you can do while you're there is bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. John Casey, ending a 21-year career among the NFL's greats. And that's our show for this time. I'm Jeff Atkinson. Thanks for watching. Comments, questions, contact us. Wingate Today is a production of WUTV and Wingate University's Department of Marketing and Communications.